My name is Philippe Dubel. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Aerospace Engineering at Illinois, and I'm going to tell you about a project that we're currently working on, on a way to make composite materials, composite structures, much faster and much more efficiently in terms of the energy that it uses. This is a highly multidisciplinary project that involves uh, faculty members and students from aerospace engineering, from material science, and engineering and from uh, chemistry. Um, all of you are probably familiar with uh, how important composite materials are, right? These are rain, these are plastic, these are polymeric materials. They are reinforced with either glass fibers or carbon fibers, and they find applications in a wide range of fields uh, from aerospace engineering with, for example, the, the 787. To, uh, to increasingly uh, automobile industry and uh, the wind energy industry, for example. Right. And the problem of making very large parts out of uh, composite material is that it's a very complex and very uh, lengthy process and therefore very expensive process. If, for example, you want to make part of the fuselage of a Boeing 787, uh, you have to use a very large autoclave that you can see here at the bottom, in the bottom left picture. Uh, these autoclaves are very large um, oven in which the temperature and the pressure profiles are controlled over multiple hours, the time that it takes to cure the epoxy. Um, on, the, on the side, you have a similar kind of process to make very large uh, composite wind turbine blades. So the objective of this project is to reduce the amount of energy used, uh, uh, involved in the manufacturing process by multiple orders of magnitude. We're talking about reducing it possibly up to eight orders of magnitude. Uh, and also to reduce the time for cure by about two orders of magnitude. So by about a hundred times faster. Uh, and so uh, the method that we will use is called frontal polymerization or frontal curing. Um, so to kind of illustrate what this uh, method is about, uh, you have this little uh, schematic diagram. So the idea is to embed in the monomer, right, is to embed a catalyst that is latent, so it doesn't do anything to it until you introduce a little bit perturbation, typically in the form of a uh, from heat of heat, and this act activates the catalyst, and uh, the catalyst starts an exothermic reaction, an exothermic polymerization of the monomer that hardens, but at the same time heats up the material ahead of it, which of course heats up the catalyst and so on, and that's how you generate a front that propagates through the entire structure. And to illustrate this, we have this very simple problem. So this is kind of a square um, um, part made of dicyclopentadine. That's the, um, the polymer that we're currently looking at. And what you're going to see on the right hand side is a front that will be initiated by the heating, the dual heating of a wire that is inside this uh, monomer. And uh, you can see that once you pass the current for just a second, and then the current is actually turned off, what you can see is the propagation of the front. Ahead of the front, this is the monomer. It's in liquid form. It has the viscosity of water. Behind the front, you have a fully polymerized uh, polymer that is pretty hard. It has the stiffness of the order of about three gigapascal, uh, which is typical for, for polymers, right? So that's what the frontal polymerization. Uh, and this allows us to make this particular part in about 78 seconds for very little energy to be compared with the amount of time and energy that you would need to uh, make the same part using a conventional oven, uh, oven cure approach. And so we can actually simulate this and that's another way to uh, visualize the evolution of the frontal polymerization. So yes, you're going to see here the propagation of uh, two fronts, right? The, the one in red correspond to the temperature profile and the one in black correspond to the degree of cure. The degree of cure is zero when it's in the monomeric form and one when it's fully cured. And you can see that 
using uh, a certain mathematical formulation, we can actually capture the propagation of the front through the part and the front propagates in a kind of a steady fashion after some uh, initial transients. So this uh, method also works for gel. So this is a partially polymerized um, um, polymer, right, of the year about 20%. And you can see here that after we introduce a little bit of heat with the soldering iron, the front propagates and polymerizes the, uh, the part. And you can see that it's uh, fully solidified. And that is also something that will be very advantageous whenever we want to give the part a certain shape at the, at the onset. And so the key contribution that we've made to this uh, process is the applicability of frontopolymerization to composite materials. So you're going to see uh, an animation that shows this is an experiment uh, where we use uh, infrared, uh, an infrared camera to illustrate the uh, polymerization of a rectangular panel that is about 10 centimeters by 20 centimeters. And we'll be able to manufacture this in, in just two minutes. Uh, this is a, a carbon fiber and DCPD uh, polymer. You can see the way we start the reaction is just like I expressed before. We just heat it up using the dual heating of a wire that is embedded. And then we just turn off the, the current and we just let the front propagate completely on its own. And you can see that it propagates through the entire part and eventually polymerizes the part. And that allows us to achieve very nice uh, panel like the panel, the 10 by uh, 20 centimeter panel on the bottom left. We can make larger ones. There's absolutely no, in principle, there's no limitation in the size of the panel that we can make. We can give panels uh, different type of shapes as indicated. Uh, in, the, in the picture on the right. And uh, looking across the thickness of the panel that is manufactured, we observe that uh, the, the amount of void that we have in the panel that is often considered as, the, as, a, as a measure of the quality of the part is very small. It's of the order of 0.18% volume fraction of the voids. Uh, for the technique that we use to make this part, right, we use a vacuum assisted uh, resin transfer molding process, the volume fraction of the fiber is about 51%, even though since then we've managed to increase that uh, fiber volume fraction to over 60-65%. Uh, so we've spent a lot of time looking at the quality of the composite part that we've made, and you have here uh, some of the specimen that we've used to uh, to assess the stiffness and the strength of the, of the, the composites uh, that are being manufactured. So you have three sets of uh, results here. The left two correspond to the classical way of making a composite using a, a layup and then an oven cure system. The FPDCPD is the same composite but made using frontopolymerization. And on the right, we have what is kind of the reference, which is a uh, oven cured uh, carbon epoxy uh, system. The blue bars, uh, the blue results correspond to the Young's modules, so the stiffness of the material. The, the red ones correspond to the strength. And these are very preliminary results because we have not optimized the uh, interface between the carbon fibers and the DCPD matrix, but we can see that we obtain uh, properties that are very similar to what we would get in an oven uh, environment, oven cure uh, system, but we can achieve that much faster. And so we end up with properties that are comparable to what we would find with a, a carbon epoxy system. Um, so this is very promising. Uh, so frontopolymerization offers a very promising way to make thermosetting polymers and composite material in a much more rapid and energy efficient way. And I, I, we have not made an entire uh, 787, obviously, but uh, all the results that we've obtained so far seem to point that a major uh, saving in terms of energy and also time. Uh, we can also speed up the process process even more by starting the front at two different locations. So we can see on the top right, you have the two, the top two figures are the actual uh, experiments that are done with two fronts uh, propagating towards each other. Uh, when they meet, we actually observe um, a thermal spike 
because the heat has nowhere to go. However, we've devised uh, since then a method to extract the heat from, uh, from, the, uh, the, from the specimen and therefore we eliminate the effect of the thermal spike. The animation that you saw uh, correspond to the uh, a simulation that we perform of the same process. Um, if, Another thing that is very exciting is the fact that now we can use frontal polymerization. I didn't have time to get into this detail, but we can use frontal polymerization as part of a 3D printing process. And you can see here on the top right, uh, the front, the frontal polymerization um, that follows right the deposition tip. And this allows us to make three free form, three dimensional objects. Uh, they are uh, uh, polymerized almost instantaneously as soon as you uh, deposit uh, the, the part. And you can see here that once you com complete it, you end up with a uh, fully polymerized system. That allows us to make some fairly complicated shapes. Um, we actually extending this research, and it's more from a fundamental perspective, is that under certain conditions, as you can see in the animation on the bottom right, the front does not propagate in a nice and smooth fashion, fashion but there are some instabilities. And we are in the process of trying to take advantage of these instabilities in a process that we call morphogenesis. So if you look at the bottom left, these are kind of classical pictures of how fingers are created uh, in a mouse. And starting from a, a configuration that is more almost like a spherical configuration all the way to fingers. And that's the process of morphogenesis, how shapes are created. And the idea is that can we take advantage of some of the instabilities of the, uh, the frontal polymerization process in order to achieve this type of uh, effect. And uh, so for more information about this research, uh, I invite all of you to look at the paper that we recently published in Nature. Um, and that kind of summarized the potential of uh, this uh, new way to make composite materials. So with this, I'll just finish with acknowledging the contribution of the many faculty members and students who are part of the Autonomous Material Systems Group that is centered primarily at the Beckman Institute at the University of Illinois. And also would like to um, acknowledge the support from the Air Force Office of Scientific Research and the National Science Foundation. Um, and I especially would like to recognize the immense contribution of our late colleague, uh, Professor Scott White, who unfortunately passed away last year. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention.